I would like to call this meeting to order. Will you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Reed. Here. Vice Mayor Litt. Here. Councilmember Woods. Here, ma'am. Councilmember Marciano. Here, ma'am. Councilmember Tinsley. Here. Excellent. Thank you so much. Are there any additions, deletions, or modifications this evening? Uh, yes, ma'am. There are three, and I handed you the sheet. All right. Thank to you read so into much. the record, please. Thank you. Our additions under consent. We have a proclamation, which is new item H and new item I, and under items for council action discussion, we have a new item B. Am I okay to go on to announcements and presentations then? All right, thank you. You have to have a motion and a vote, please, hey, to, thank to you adopt so much. the ADM. All right, let's go ahead and adopt these additions. So may I get a motion and a second, please? What is, what is can, can you say what they are? Yeah, absolutely. Please. So under our consent, we have a proclamation. And that has been provided to you here. I don't see a proclamation. Uh, so the proclamation is uh, not, it's actually with a tremendous amount of sadness. We're presenting an addition this evening on Thursday, January 26th. A 17 year volunteer in our police department lost his life in a tragic car accident. Dr. Howard Wexler, known to everyone as Doc, was a volunteer in the police department from 2006 to 2023. And we have added this proclamation in the hopes of honoring him and adopting it. And uh, we actually attended the service today. It was a, a very moving service. He's been a tremendous part of our community for a long time. It was so sad to hear of a passing of someone who has contributed so much in life just as a, a person, let alone what he's done for the city. So we are all moved and honored to be there. And so that is, and with sadness, we're adding this proclamation. Excuse me. Uh, then new item I is resolution, resolution 16. We have a Senate bill, which is Senate Bill 350, and House Bill 235, which supports mobility and clarifying the previous language made by the state of Florida regarding mobility, and we're, we're moving forward with that. And then under items for council action discussion and items of interest, we have resolution 14, which is our new item B, 14-2023, which is establishing the April meeting date and time due to um, conflicts on the calendar. So for that, I am looking for a motion in a Thank second. you, I will make a motion to pass the consent agenda. It's to adopt the agenda as amended. Please. To adopt the agenda as amended. Second. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Thank you, Patty. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you so much. Next, next, we have announcements and presentations. First, we have the recognition of Sergeant Carl Cooper. Can we please have Police Chief Clint Shannon, thank you, come to the podium. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Council Members. For the record, Clint Shannon, your Chief of Police. Um, if I can have Sergeant Carl Cooper uh, join me, please, up at the podium. I got to tell you, we kind of duped him into to being here tonight. He thought that uh, the reason that he's here is we're going to recognize the work of all our officers in the deployment to Sanibel. But the truth of the matter is we've singled him out uh, because of his outstanding leadership. And we wanted to make sure that you are aware of his uh, of the job that he did over on the West Coast and how proud of, of, uh, of him we are. Uh, to give you a little bit of a... Uh, background, and I know you have a, a lot of information about what went on over in Sanibel, but uh, on September 28, 2022, uh, Hurricane Ian, a strong Category 4 storm, devastated the west coast of Florida, causing catastrophic damage to Sanibel Island. The entire island's power grid was destroyed, and the causeway leading to the island was severely damaged. Sanibel police immediately requested assistance from other police jurisdictions to assist them with policing duties uh, during the, the post-storm recovery. Palm Beach Gardens Police, at the request from the Florida Police Chiefs Association, teamed up with other jurisdictions, sending a multitude of officers uh, for deployment for a one-month period. 
Sergeant Cooper immediately volunteered assistance in the operation and took over a key role as the island's incident commander on the fourth week of deployment. Sergeant Cooper advised that prior to our arrival, Santa Police re Sanibel Police reported over 60 residential burglaries that had occurred and that they had needed a strong police pre presence to combat the surging crime wave. Sergeant Cooper had officers working 16-hour shifts exclusively at night, patrolling, answering calls for service, and providing security checkpoints to identify anyone coming onto the island. The officers also used night vision surveillance equipment, unmanned aerial systems, our drones, and advanced patrol tactics to deter and apprehend criminals. This strategy greatly lowered criminal activity while we were deployed on the island. As the oper operation approached the Thanksgiving holiday, no other de departments volunteered to assist Sergeant Cooper and a dozen dedicated Palm Beach Gardens officers that volunteered to work that week, performing the normal law enforcement operations of 50 or 60 officers. Sergeant Cooper is being recognized tonight for his strong leadership, dedication to serve, and for effectively coordinating public safety on the island during extremely challenging times. Like we had mentioned, one of the proudest was when I went over to, uh, to Sanibel early Thanksgiving morning to not only to show Sergeant Cooper appreciation, but to all of our officers. Um, the accolades that we received from, from Sanibel made, made me extremely proud. But uh, Sergeant Cooper quietly uh, showed his leadership skills over there and just did, a, did an amazing job. He was doing uh, the work of, of, of ranks that were much higher above him the previous three weeks. So. Uh, tonight, and, and Sarge, that's why a, a lot of, a lot of your, your teammates are here too, but we want to recognize you for the amazing job you did. And of course, we have our, our award ceremony to recognize Sergeant Cooper, but the job he did I thought was worthy of special recognition, certainly before the Mayor and Council tonight. So, Sarge? Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> I need a minute. <laughs> He's going to kill me for this later. So. Okay, okay. We, we can actually see his face. You can. <laughs> I don't think I've seen more humility. Thank you. Take a moment. We love you, Carl. Let's just say you made us very proud. Thank you. I'll tell you what, we'd like to take a picture with you. Let's with, do that first. With all of your, with all of your, <laughs> with all of your uh, uniform personnel. So we'll, we'll do that for a breather. Thank you. They're going to come down. Oh, okay. So well deserved. Oh, Thank you. So proud of you. Bring that, and we're going to, let's go. Where do you want us, David? Uh, Up here.
thanks for giving me the minute. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to say that um, it's, a, it's an honor, um, especially in, such, in front of such a, uh, an esteemed audience to receive this award. Um, and although I'm getting it uh, individually, I must say that the leadership we have at our police department from the chief down to the uh, captain and also the songs I work alongside, um, they played a part in this because I basically just took everything over the years that I uh, hear and see and um, it caused me to uh, do as well as I did. Also, the officers that were uh, deployed alongside me uh, couldn't have done it without them. They uh, did a tremendous uh, job, and also some of the officers that I work with uh, from other departments. So although I'm getting this award individually, it's really uh, a plethora of factors that went into this. So thank you. Madam Mayor, do you mind if I ask a quick question? Yeah, please. Sergeant, before you go, Sergeant, Sergeant, Carl. before you go, um, can you just give us a quick snippet of what it was like those days after the storm when you guys and how many other departments were there? Uh, because none of us, I mean, we all felt it, we, but we weren't there. We didn't see it. We all had friends and people that we knew that, was, that were impacted. But can you just share a, a, maybe a story or two? Sergeant, can I please ask you to return to the microphone? Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'll just start with the nuances. Um, uh, Sanibel uh, was hot for the most part. Um, you were getting bit by sand flies. Um, the officers, they uh, slept in uh, air-conditioned trailers on bunks, top and bottom. Um, we had um, a kitchen where they were fed 24 hours a day. And basically at night, the, the guys, they uh, patrol different zones, uh, try to deter um, burglary from occurring on the island. You had issues with uh, tow trucks uh, entering the island, leaving with vehicles that they're not supposed to uh, leave with. So checkpoints were set up and the officers were charged uh, with checking the, uh, the manifest that the tow truck drivers have to make sure that they're leaving with the vehicles that they were sent to pick up. Um, also, they uh, did house checks. Um, as you know, most of the island lost power, but the power was slowly coming on from week to week. And, um, you know, they treated, you know, down wires as if they were alive. Um, they uh, assisted citizens uh, going to and off the island. And they also uh, did beach patrol to make sure that, because we had um, violators who were coming in by uh, jet skis and boats. Uh, to commit burglaries also. So it wasn't just coming across uh, the bridge on, by vehicle, but they were doing it by boats and jet skis also. Well, we're so thankful for your service and for allowing us to give you this uh, appreciation for your service as well. And uh, we know you had a lot of, you didn't mention that you didn't sleep a lot either, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> I mean, it comes with the territory. Well, we really appreciate everything you did there and um, everything that you do here. And so we, um, we're going to make you stay there for one more second. Okay. I'm going to jump ahead. Normally we do comment cards after presentations, but we do have a comment card from um, Brett Leon, who is on our council. If he could please, I mean, on our um, staff, if he could please come to the podium, uh, state your name and address for the record, sir. Council, for the record, um, Brett Leone, 132 Barbados, up in Jupiter. Um, nice to come before you all, not, uh, not as staff tonight, but as, as a citizen of the state of Florida and um, also as an employee of the city. And I know I've mentioned this to Chief. Um, my wife's family's lived on Sanibel for 50 years, and um, we took a boat over the weekend after, or the first weekend they allowed us to come over. And um, that was, I don't think you touched on it, but going over there, um, right away, I've, I've never been deployed, I've never been to, you know, third world countries, but what you see in movies and videos, that's exactly what Sanibel looked like. And um, it was pretty devastating to know how beautiful of an island it is to what it was turned to um, due to the wrath of Mother Nature. Um, one of the, the shining moments is we went over the weekend, the, the causeway first opened, and one of the first police cars I saw sitting 
at the base of that causeway was a Palm Beach Gardens police officer. Uh, didn't have the chance to stop because there were a million cars behind me, but in my heart, you know, I knew a piece of, of home was there and that you all were doing your job to keep the island safe. And um, yeah, I know you guys were working at night, but talking with Chief Shannon and knowing um, everything you guys did to keep the island safe, uh, you know, wanted to get up here as a public comment and say thank you. Thank you to Chief, thank you to you, sir, and the rest of the officers and the leadership from the council and everything like that. So uh, again, thank you all for everything you did for the island. Um, I'm not a resident over there, but I think if, uh, if they'd allow me to, I'd speak on behalf of them and say thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Brett. So we could do this all night, but you're, you're, you're allowed to. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. We are really, really deeply appreciative. Thank you. Really, really. These are, yeah, terrible situation made better. Uh, next is the 2022 Mayor's Veteran Golf Classic check presentation. We have Casey Mitchell, our Director of Golf. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. For the record, Casey Mitchell, General Manager at the Sand Hill Crane Golf Club. I have a slideshow that's going to play while I give my presentation. Um, I'd like to start with a little history of the tournament for those who are not aware. Um, 2022 marked the 16th year that the city hosted the event at Sand Hill Crane Golf Club. The event was hosted on November 5th with a full field of 144 players. Over 85 city employees and volunteers assisted throughout the day with all of the funds raised during the event being donated to the West Palm Beach VA Resource Center to help our homeless and indigent veterans in need. Joining us tonight, uh, staff from the VA, we have Julia Spence, the Assistant Director, Mason Yule, the Homeless Program Social Work Section Chief, and Dr. Ronald K. Williams, Chief of Staff, who's here to give an update on how those funds will be used. Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Councils, and esteemed guests and sponsors, thank you very much for having me here. I'm Dr. Ron Williams, the Chief of Staff at the uh, VA West Palm Beach. Uh, sorry I wasn't there this year for the first time. I was called up on active duty, so uh, I heard it was a fun time. So I heard everyone had a great time there. Um, it's amazing how year after year we continue to gather for such a special purpose, and every time I can't help to take that step back to take it all in. Uh, who knew that the sport of golf would have such an impact uh, thank you for all who made this possible. Your drive on and off the course allowed for life-changing beginnings for many of our veterans. As uh, Matt Mason previously mentioned during the, this year's tournament, your partnership is essential in shaping a bright future for most of our most vulnerable veteran populations. These funds will go towards rent, utility expenses, transportation assistance, hygiene and home supplies, and so much more. Before I had handed over to Mason to speak about this a little bit more, again, I want to stress and capture amongst you all the value this holds in the hearts of our team. To have this annual donation to support better days ahead for our veterans is more than just dollar bills. It's a community support like no other. Having a community partner is honorable, and we will, well, with one that I am uh, forever grateful for what I can see firsthand as a progressive opportunities, is not only creates, but also sustains our veterans uh, and stability for our veterans, and thank you. Uh, without ado, um, I would like to offer uh, to Madison over the personal appreciation uh, to, on behalf of the homeless program, year after year, he continues, Mason, to gather for such a special purpose, and every time I can't help but take a step back again. This impact 
is a great thing for our veterans and will have a lot of important sustained things for their rent, utility expenses, transportation, hygiene, and home supplies that we mentioned more. So I'm going to hand it over to Mason to speak a little bit more and stress and capture amongst you the value this holds hard to our scenes and how this is more than just dollar bills and this community support is like no other. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Mason and personal appreciation on behalf of the homeless program as he is our director of the program. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Um, you know, uh, I just wanted to put in context uh, how these funds are used um, every day. Uh, you know, I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of our housing crisis, of how expensive it is to live in Palm Beach County, um, and it's not getting any better. So the money that is donated, we use every day to help support veterans get into a housing, supply them with that first month, that security deposit, fixing their car, paying their utilities. I mean, these are individuals that may have hit hard times. They tend to be the most marginalized folks in our community. And without these funds, we would not be able to support them like we do. Um, I mean, we were talking earlier, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, I don't think the public is aware of how much the VA actually does for our veterans. But with that said, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without your support. So this money is incredibly important, and uh, I thank you very much for it. <clears throat> I'd like to take this opportunity to thank council and city administration for their support of this event and the volunteers and staff who assisted in making this tournament possible. There are far too many names to list, um, but planning for this event starts in March every year, um, and it simply would not be possible without those, those volunteers. Um, Palm Beach Gardens High School Choir came to sing the national anthem. Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue Department and the Honor Guard were there as well. Our local businesses and organizations who made in-kind contributions to the event are players and our sponsors. There's a couple of sponsors I'd like to take a minute to recognize. Um, first, the Palm Beach Gardens Police and Fire Rescue Foundation who supported the event as our presenting sponsor this year for a $5,000 donation. And our Albatross sponsors, TBC Corporation, JW Cheatham, and Alan Norton in Blue. We have two additional Albatross sponsors joining us tonight, our city attorney and Navy veteran from Loman Law Group, Mr. Max Loman, and from Florida Power and Light, Mr. Donald Keselowski. And I'd like to ask both of them to join council for the check presentation, please. And I'm very proud to announce this year that we were able to raise $70,704.21 for the Resource Center.
Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. <laughs>
uh, we provide, actually that number's uh, outdated, we provide over 7.2 million rides per year. Um, and we have, a, 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 my organization is about 650 people, um, you know, 400 contractors, a little over 1,000 people, uh, 500 vehicles to include you know, the fixed route, the 45th bus, our paratransit service, which is door-to-door -door service for our elderly and disabled, and a new service we call microtransit, uh, it's mobility on demand. And so we'll talk to you a little bit about that service. But you know, to the right is essentially all the service we provide uh, in this very geographically large county, which is uh, definitely a challenge. Uh, but we, we do uh, provide mass transit for public. Uh, some of the major projects uh, that we have endeavored in uh, include, uh, uh, you know, modernizing our fleet. Uh, as you can see, the photo on the, on the left is a fixed route bus. They're very functional. Uh, it does the job for us. But uh, the, the photo on the right is a redesigned bus with more smoother lines and you know, have great intelligence uh, features inside the bus. Um, just to point out one, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, one of the things we are you know, majorly concerned with considering we operate in one of the more, most confined spaces there is, a bus. And so we wanted to ensure that we protected and looked out for the safe and well-being, the safety and well-being of our customers. So we installed on all of our buses, including our smaller vans, a, a state-of-the-art air filtration system, uh, which is essentially proactively uh, cleanse and, 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 and cleanse and, and sanitize the entire bus. Um, it's a system where it converts um, hydrogen peroxide to molecular um, hydrogen, I'm sorry, it converts humidity to um, uh, molecular hydrogen peroxide. And it actually cleans the stanchions, the seats, and the air in the bus. And we invested a lot in that, and so uh, our customers are, are very happy with the implementation of that system. We also implemented um, a uh, state-of-the-art fair collection system. You know, my, my thing is, is uh, for our customers who don't usually take transit, uh, we wanted to make it really simple for them. So this is a very sophisticated system that I can take 30 to 40 minutes to explain, but I essentially explain it like this. You should be able to ride our service with anything on your person, any type of fair media. So when you approach the bus, you shouldn't have to think about it. So if you have cash, if you have a credit card, if you have an a, a, a iPhone, if you have a smartwatch, you should be able to pay your fare. And that's the system that we designed and implemented in November of 2021. Um, here's the mobility on demand service um, we call Go Glades. Um, this is our Uber and Lyft type service that we introduced to Palm Beach County. And we're looking at the eastern part of the counties to see where um, we can implement this type of service. Um, so the mobility on demand essentially, you know, picks you up at your origination point and takes you to your destination, just like Uber and Lyft. It's hailed using the app, the GoGlaze app that we created. You can actually see the vehicle approaching your, your origination point and your destination, similar to Uber. The better thing about this than Uber, Uber usually is a one seat ride. This is a shared ride system. So the cost is a lot less uh, expensive. So we, customers share the ride, we organize the demand, but we, it's door to door. And you know, when we, we were studying areas, I think we looked at about 13 areas with, uh, within the east uh, uh, footprint of the county. And the, the, the two areas that rated the highest were um, Palm Beach Gardens and Royal Palm. And so we have started some conversations with the mayor and her and, and, and the management about you know, potentially implementing a, a mobility on demand service in this region. Um, and so we hope to continue those uh, conversations. Uh, but we believe that this is, you know, we provide fixed route system, which is a the large bus, and we want that system to be as linear as possible. That really makes an efficient transit system. If that big bus makes too many turns, it's inefficient. But this complements, this will complement our fixed route system. You know, and it will be scaled in a way where it's not very expensive, and it only cover, um, you know, certain you know uh, areas within a given municipality. Um, our zero emission plan. Just to hit on this, we are um, 
converting our uh, propulsion to uh, zero emission fleet, 25% zero emission by 2032, pretty aggressive plan. Uh, but we hope to procure our first buses uh, this year and have delivery next year. And I'd like to introduce uh, Yash Nagal. He's, he's really the planner and the brains of Palm Tran. <laughs> and so I'm going to allow him to talk to you about some recent service changes that we made here in the gardens uh, that we believe are providing better service to the residents and visitors, uh, as well as our bus shelter program that we'd like you to have information on. Yash. Good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, and present to all of you. But more than that, thank you for keeping this city very beautiful and you know making the city very beautiful. I live not too far from here, and I'm a really happy resident. So I just wanted to mention that before we jumped in. So we did make a significant service change where we switched our Route 1 and Route 21 uh, between Prosperity Farm Throat and US 1. Uh, we saw that there was a lot more potential for picking up people in US 1 than there was on Prosperity Farm. So uh, we put more buses through US 1, trying to provide them better services. There's more businesses out there. Uh, so that was the rationale. We're still testing the service out. Um, we'll keep you updated with the results. But you know, this is our um, this is our efforts in making the system more rideable. Um, and just all, I also want to mention that one of our um, one of our largest transit hubs are also in the city. Is also in the city, uh, the Garden Small. Uh, it has about seven routes that goes through it. So it is a very um, good transit ridership hub where a lot of people are utilizing the service and we're very proud to provide that service there. So I'll jump quickly into the bus shelter program. Uh, really, we began this plan in 2019 with the TPA coming out with a shelter design guideline. Um, you know, we put it out for solicitation because we wanted to implement the plan in 2020. Unfortunately, the plan was based off of an old model of advertising. Uh, we did not get any returns on it. We had to go back to the drawing board, uh, make a few changes, and this year, actually in December, is what we've resolicited the contract, uh, which is right now out there for um, uh, out there for to bid for. So we're very happy to implement that plan. It's already in motion. Um, jumping into the type of shelters that you all have in the city, um, that's just a design that you have. Uh, we have a significant amount of infrastructure in the city, so there's good amount of usage. I also wanted to quickly mention the um, the photograph on your left. That's what we call a semi seat. It is very helpful in providing seating when there's limited right of way. Uh, so we've been able to utilize this to um, throughout just the county uh, to provide our passengers better service. On the left side, as you see, um, is the current shelter that we have. A little old, uh, you know, not very good looking. And on the right side is what you see is what we're moving towards. This is, of course, not the actual um, shelter that we've picked yet because the because uh, we haven't picked a vendor yet. Uh, but this is what we're trying to, that's a prototype of what we want to do. Uh, of course, this is going to come with different branding options because we understand that different cities want to have a different outlook to how they want the amenities inside their uh, municipality to look like. So we wanted to make sure that we made, we left some room for creativity there. Uh, other than that, there are other amenities in this improvement plan too. There's things like digital screens. Um, you know, we talked about semi seeds before, solar lighting being another big one. Uh, it's really important for us because that's an aspect of safety. Safety is the first thing that we want to do and consider. And also for our operators to be able to see if there's passengers on the road at night or not. Um, in our first phase, of, first phase of our implementation plan, uh, we do have two or three shelters that are in the municipality. Um, uh, they're on, uh, on and around um, Military Trail, another one of our uh, big Ridership route, Route 3 goes there, so that was one of the locations. And there's a few ADA improvements that we want to make, too, throughout the city. Uh, just also reimagining the blade, the top blade that we have. We want to have something that's more modern. Uh, you see a big, big QR code there, because that's where a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the population is moving. They're understanding what a QR code does. Our ultimate vision is to have something that people can point their phone towards, and it just gives you when the bus is arriving, um, you know, how much I, I do I have to wait, all of that information. So we're just trying to eliminate the middle steps and trying to get people to their final destination as quick as possible. Oh, I went in reverse. This is just a rendering of what we want our future to look like. Um, you can see in the photos, we, we have all the amenities that we talked about. We've called this project a bus stop of the future, because before we went out and bought what we wanted to buy, 
we had to, to you know, understand and imagine what is it that we're looking for. So that's where this rendering is going to be really helpful. And really, this is what we want our future to look like. And Mayor and, and council members, that, that concludes our presentation. Um, you know, this presentation is more about really just communication, collaboration, and cooperation from you and your team as we endeavor in this project. I just have to say that we, I actually love your shelters. Uh, and so if you want to stick to that design, it's something that we can work with. Uh, but, you know, we are going to a more sexier uh, type sh shelter. Uh, but we want to collaborate with you as we implement this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for coming. Does anyone have anything? Anyone leaning forward? Well, we appreciate, I know you met with Angela um, from our staff to talk about the shelters uh, a few months ago. So thank you for that, for collaborating with us. And also, Council Member Tinsley was on council when the bus shelters began. She's the thought of it. That, that was my baby. Well, with the whole team, I should say, but uh, Art in Public Places, that's Great a job. fun project that I really, really love working on. So very, if, you, if I may, Mayor, very apropos that you came this uh, meeting because at the last meeting, your ears must have been burning. We were talking about um, Palm Trans stopping at the new Alton uh, Hospital which is, was just approved. So uh, it's, it's very apropos that you came uh, today. And um, I noticed on your presentation, you mentioned NOVA, um, but also state, the State College too, um, right ac practically across the mall, across the street from the mall. Exactly. And I see sometimes uh, the students darting, like practically prank, playing Frogger crossing PGA Boulevard to get to the mall um, bus, uh, the big you know, bus station there, which I remember when they moved it to the area near Sears. It was a long time ago, but it was very needed because there was a lot of people that uh, were standing and needing, you know, needing to hop on Palm Trans. So uh, you know, planning is very important, and I appreciate you guys working with us so much to um, make it even better. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have, don't go. We're, we're chatting for a little longer, Michelle. Since Marcy brought up Palm Beach State, and I was part of that initial discussion with the students uh, where you came and, and talked to us. Where, where are we on those discussions on moving the bus stop so they don't have to dart across PGA Boulevard? Right, and so Yash worked on that project. I asked him a couple times to evaluate it, so he has some information for you. Uh, but I, but I, I will say that you know the, the options that we want to introduce such as first and last mile service, mobility on demand, might be a solution, you know, to giving more direct service and not having that big bus deviate into the college. But uh, Yash, could you give her the sure. latest information? So um, we've been touch in touch with the college to discuss exactly what Mr. Forbes said. Um, we looked at a few options. We evaluated if the fixed route bus has to go in, you know, how much would that cost? Because uh, it's deviating, obviously, off of its, its path. And, you know, the fixed route bus really does it isn't made to do a lot of sharp turns. Um, so our converse, we've been in conversations. We're still discussing it with the college, uh, but we'll keep you updated. Uh, but the, but what we're looking towards is the first and last mile option, because that's really what, uh, you know, what, that's really a service that is applicable towards um, the smaller regions so that they can connect to the bigger fixed route system. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you, Yash, because I've been I've been around for the recent conversations uh, regarding this, and so we're we're waiting again to hear back from the the school itself and looking at the land that they have. So it's it is collaborative, and unfortunately, it's just not one of those things that you can just you know ma wave a magic wand and poof, there's suddenly more right of way and places to put a bus stop. So. Thank you guys for coming here tonight. As you know, um, most of us up here can talk about transportation and mobility for hours and hours, but we'll, we'll let you go, most of us. And um, again, it was really great to hear about Go Glades, about your mobility on demand projects and how that has really changed lives out there so that people can get service door to door for $2 each way. That's extraordinary. The measures you've taken um, in reaction to COVID with the clean air filtration and the electric buses coming, it's, it's all stuff that uh, fits into the culture that we're encouraging here as well with our transit oriented development and emphasis on mobility. So thank you for being a part of it with us. Thank you. I'll also offer a thank you for Go Glades and helping Leadership Palm Beach County bring our students in so that they can experience the GROW program because that was a really big problem on how these students were going to participate with the students in the rest of the county. So thanks for that too. Glad to be a part of that. Thank you.
Thank you, Councilman. All right, excellent. Thank you guys so much for coming. You guys are doing a great job. We appreciate it. All right, next we're moving on to comments from the public. I do have two cards tonight. When I call your name, please come up and state your name and address. You'll have three minutes to address us. First card is for Douglas Grant, please. Hello, my name's Douglas Grant. I live at 301 Balsam Street. And I'm coming to the city council tonight because I've had a problem with a neighbor who has been, had a, um, a daycare. Well, it got shut down. So now the guys use this front yard as like a playground for like eight kids, and it's eight kids screaming their heads off. I came to you last year, I had submitted some tape to code enforcement, and, um, and it seems like it got slipped through the cracks, and I'm not complaining, I'm not pointing fingers. All I'm wanting is somebody to look at it. I have a lot of tape of exactly what I'm talking about, it's crossed the line, and it goes on from 5 to like 8 o'clock at night. So I'm asking city council or the other people to please look at it. And like I said, I have this tape. I'm ready to go with it. Could somebody please get hold of me? And that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Otherwise, uh, everything in the city is great. Oh. <laughs> except, okay, except for that one little patch of land. Understood. Thank you so much. We have your information. Thanks for coming tonight. All right, next we have Ralph Lewis, please. Hello. If you could state your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Ralph Lewis, and I'm in 625 North Flagler Drive, uh, Palm Beach, Florida. So what I came to talk to you about today is the Children's Symphony Orchestra. My goal is to save 500 at-risk children uh, from the streets of Palm Beach County. One in five kids are likely, are living in impoverished conditions and are likely to commit a crime. I myself lived in impoverished conditions, but I did not turn out that way. But I do know how that can affect those kids as well. Uh, we created a program, which is called the Children's Symphony Orchestra by my foundation. And uh, this year, I plan on raising $3 million to be able to save them all. We're gonna teach them, I have already hired a music director. We're gonna teach them music. We are gonna, going to give them the actual instruments themselves um, and also take them in after schools with activity buses and feed them and help them out with their homeworks. We really need your help um, as far as this goes. It's just support goes. Uh, I've been trying to get in contact with you <laughs> and it's been kind of hard so I came here today to see if I could at least be able to set up a meeting with you guys, with the, my board of directors, to be able to push along this conversation. Um, so far, since I've started this, uh, raised over $7,000 already. Um, what I usually do for the community or Palm Beach County is turkey drives, which we fed over our 100,000 meals so far, or given out over 100,000 turkeys so far. In Palm Beach County, uh, in Boynton Beach, Port St. Lucie, Broward County, um, and Lake Worth, Florida as well. So today, uh, as I've been spending more time in Palm, uh, Palm Beach Gardens, I do know that you guys could possibly help me with this mission to be able to stop these kids to get involved in either becoming a drug user or going to jail or even worse. That's all. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know if I received anything from you or any of us have, but we're happy to meet you tonight and um, we'll reach out to you for some more information. We have your, is, it, is this the information we need to reach out to you that's on this card? Uh, does that have my phone number on there? It, it does not. So if you'd be so kind as to, to provide your information to our clerk over here, she'll take it for you and we'll, uh, we'll reach okay. out. We also have an event on March 2nd that Go we'll be it. doing. Go for it. March sorry, <laughs> March 2nd that we'll be having. And on that event on March 2nd, we'll have some of the children out there that we have already started training to show you guys the progress that we've been making. Where and what time? Uh, March 2nd, 5.30. Uh, 150 Worth Avenue, Suite 216. All right, great. We'll get that information from you. Got it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Okay, great. You got it. Thank you for coming tonight. I know that's not easy to do. We appreciate it. Yep, all right. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I do have a, f a couple of items to, actually several items to bring to your attention uh, tonight. <clears throat> Seems to be the night for presentations. Uh, first off, I'd, I would uh, like to call Casey Mitchell back up to the podium, please, to uh, I have a certain council member that's been bugging me week after week after week about are we going to get a progress report here on the uh, par three uh, development out there. I don't want to mention any names, but he's wearing a white shirt. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I've asked Casey to bring us uh, up to date on this fabulous par three golf course that's being developed and uh, I uh, also want to give kudos to Casey, who does such a wonderful job uh, as far as the 18 whole course is concerned. And uh, I have a requisition in for a clone. Hopefully, <laughs> we I can can't deal with another me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. If you bring us up to date, please. Yes, absolutely. So um, I'm going to do a, a just a. I'm going to narrate this video. It's about two and a half minutes long. But I first want to thank Chris Denhart and Joe Correo for taking this video. Um, they came out earlier this week, and uh, Mike Armit, who was able to kind of cut and put it together for you guys. Um, so we're going to start here. This is the um, existing clubhouse for those who haven't seen um, the facility. It's at 9500 Sand Hill Crane Drive. Um, the facility here is our existing clubhouse cart barn and maintenance facility. So it's gonna pan west and it's gonna take you along the, the connector road. So it's gonna connect our west parking lot to our new facility. The homes uh, that you see closest to you are, is going to be ancient tree. <clears throat> There's a 12 foot wide multi-use path for those who don't know who's gonna, what's gonna connect to Avenir. Um, cycling, walking, golf carts will be able to access the facility as well. And this is the parking lot for our new facility. Um, this is the 30,000 square foot putting green. We'll have 18 grass holes that we're going to move, um, kind of like a Himalayas green. And then a 60,000 square foot grass tee. Um, the driving range is to the right, and we're going to pan over and go over our cart barn, which is going to house the additional carts needed for the par three. Just adjacent to that is going to be the new practice facility. It's roughly three and a half times the size of our current facility and located in an area where it's very safe to practice. Um, the clubhouse is about 14,000 square feet. It's going to pan to the back side of it where you'll see the nine hitting uh, Driving range bay is downstairs, nine upstairs. We have the indoor outdoor bar upstairs and the outdoor bar downstairs. That's going to, they're all going to be equipped with TrackMan technology, which is the same launch monitor that the PGA Tour uses to track ball flight for the PGA Tour. So this connector road is, we're picking back up at the facility and heading now towards Avenir. Um, Ancient tree on the left and Avenir coming up one of the first parcels on the immediate left now. We have the, when we pan back over, you'll see the, the 16, 17, 18, 19 complex. The 19th hole is going to be used for our charity shootout to help with um, additional charities and fundraising for our local nonprofits. And we are back at the Avenir entrance, the clubhouse, the main Avenir clubhouse is just to your right. This is 16 to the right, 15 to the left. The tallest point is about 22 feet of elevation change. A peninsula green and then our island green, which is hole number 19 right there. So we're panning back towards the clubhouse. So we are about 90 to 95% completed on the, the course itself. We have some littoral plantings and some small um, brush and shrubs to plant, but the course itself is grassed and sprigged and is growing in. Is it going to be done before April? We're looking at um, yes. we're looking at late <laughs> April. We're looking at May first to open everything. So we do need some time to get in there. Obviously, there's a lot that goes into this. So 
once kitchen equipment is in, we have all of our staff has to move in. We have to outfit the golf shop. We have to outfit food and beverage. We have a lot of staff and hiring to do for food and beverage and making sure that we're providing a good product, um, moving all the office furniture in, getting TrackMan up and running, um, so on and so forth. So, I, But we are pushing the project along, and they are moving. So yes, we're hoping very, very soon. But we need a, about a month to move in about a month where we will run the driving range independently just to get a feel for traffic. And then we'll open everything together with the golf course, the driving range, food and beverage, the clubhouse, the golf shop, the party, is the everything. So, yes. Do we start reserving party space now? Absolutely. For, okay, we already good. have two on the books. And we expect <laughs> to be invited back for the ribbon cutting. Absolutely. Carl, did you? All right, go ahead, sir. Keep going. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Uh, next, I would like to bring up uh, Corey Wilder. He's going to talk to you a little bit about the dog park opening and improvements. Thank you, Mr. Ferris. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Council Members. Uh, as Mr. Ferris mentioned, I'm here to give you a, a couple updates to a couple changes to uh, two different parks, uh, the first being the Lilac Dog Park. So the Lilac Dog Park closed in late October for improvements to be made to the park. Um, typically, we close the park twice a year for about four to six weeks for grass replacement. Uh, this time, we closed it for some permanent uh, repairs. The feedback we've received over the years from dog park patrons uh, has consistently been regarding two items, uh, the lengthy annual closures and um, the, the mud and dirt that is created as a result of uh, the wear and tear from the dogs. Um, as part of our five-year uh, capital improvement plan, we budgeted funds uh, a few years back with the intention of improving the dog park with synthetic turf to address these uh, concerns brought to us by the dog park patrons. Um, we ended up spending approximately uh, just shy of $150,000 on the improvements. Um, I'm going to scan forward. Uh, this is just before the improvements were made. Um, as you can see, the, the turf gets worn out. Um, the, the folks that utilize this park are very passionate. The dogs are very passionate. And uh, they create a lot of wear and tear. Um, we reopened the park in, uh, as of January 3rd uh, with about 7,000 square feet of canine synthetic turf grass, um, which is specifically designed for dogs. It has a knitted backing, whereas some other uh, synthetic turf where you play football on or, or, or uh, soccer on has a, like a carpet backing. So this knitted, knitted backing allows for uh, matter to flow through much more freely. Um, we upgraded the irrigation system. Uh, we freshened up existing amenities. Uh, we upgraded the landscaping with river rock. And we added uh, additional concrete pads for seating for uh, more patrons to enjoy the shade. Uh, we're proud that we kept uh, all the shades, uh, the shade trees uh, in the park and worked around them. We also kept the existing play equipment uh, around the turf. Uh, you can see the, the improvements on the picture here. Uh, I think I got another photo from another view. Um, this view used to be uh, largely impacted by dogs as the, the patrons would come and sit at those nearby shades and, and the, the turf would get worn out rather quickly. So now hopefully they can enjoy it a, a, a lot longer. Um, the dog park's divided into a, a small dog and an all dog side. This is on the uh, small dog side. Uh, so they got uh, a, a little smaller piece of synthetic turf, but uh, they tend to do a lot less damage. So uh, I think it'll be welcomed. Any questions? I don't. I don't have a question, do you, Marcy. Do you want to? I have a statement, but go ahead. Just a statement, I, if you don't mind. Please. Um, I just appreciate all your hard work on this. I know I've received numerous uh, emails and uh, comments regarding the dog park over the years. I've used it. Uh, several times and stopped using it because it was so muddy and dirty and I ended up having to bathe my dogs every time I got home. So I appreciate it very much. I know everyone will appreciate it and uh, I appreciate all of your hard work and effort uh, to make it a special place in our city. It looks more like the Jupiter one now, which is, I hate to say it, that's where I started going because it was so much easier than this one. So I know, but now I'm coming what? back. The what? <laughs> No, yeah. it, it looks great, and my inbox is much quieter, so mm -hmm. thank you. And that, I think that's something I did not expect 
when I got to come onto the city council with this amazing crew was um, was expecting we'd spend a lot of time, you know, obviously doing policy and things like that. But the sheer amount of emails about um, the dog park turf, pickleball, and golf. Uh, <laughs> so thank you so much for what you've done for the community and for for what you've done for our inboxes. We appreciate it. So if I may, Corey, will you tell us a little bit about this butterfly habitat? Yes, sir. So the other change to our parks is um, our Oaks Park Butterfly Garden. So we, um, we felt like we wanted to uh, contribute to an endangered species, which is the monarch butterfly. Um, and we wanted to put it in a location where we thought it would complement the existing park. So we chose Oaks Park. Um, so not only does this new amenity, amenity uh, uh, make this park better, it makes the trail better. So uh, what you see on the screen here is where it is located on the east side of the tennis courts over at um, Oaks Park. Um, our team put a lot of effort into researching and providing a natural habitat that would be conducive with promoting the uh, butterfly life cycle. Um, within a few days of planting these different species of plants, we had butterflies, caterpillars, and cocoons. Um, I think the thing that we found in interesting was, you know, when we build pickleball courts, we know that people are going to play pickleball. When we build a butterfly garden, we just pray that it brings butterflies. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it did, and uh, they continued to thrive. So within, uh, within a week or, or so, they had eaten uh, a lot of the milkweed. So the caterpillars tend to feed off of the milkweed, and uh, they have done every bit of that. So um, we're excited about this new amenity. Um, I think it's a great addition to the park. Um, by contributing to monarch butterfly habitats, we contribute to other pollinators and other insects. and. Uh, other butterflies um, among the entire ecosystem. So um, this is a, right as we began, uh, we planted a, a few more oak trees uh, right along the trail. We added a little bit more trail inside this uh, garden. And then as we were finishing up, uh, you can see the plantings inside of there, uh, hundred, hundreds of different plants, new signage, uh, split rail, and additional trails. So uh, most importantly, I uh, wanted to invite everybody, council, uh, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, residents to our grand opening on March 3rd uh, at 10 o'clock. Uh, we hope to uh, see you all there and uh, get to enjoy this facility with uh, your families. We'll be there. And I know um, the Oaks Park or Oaks East and Oaks area community, again, have been sending a lot of emails asking for the opening date because I think that staff tried to set this up and see how it went and hope the butterflies came. All the residents came and they saw that and they suddenly realized there's this beautiful butterfly garden in an area that used to be just a, a path. So it's extraordinary. We can't wait to support you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Corey. Next, I uh, would like to bring up Wendy Tatum <clears throat> uh, to talk about uh, some programs. Uh, at the pickleball and tennis world. Good evening, Madam, Madam Mayor and Council. Thank you for having us here, Ron, tonight, this evening. Um, we just wanted to go over a little bit of our, you guys know Andy, um, operations manager tennis. We just wanted to go over a little of our past events so you guys would know what we've been doing out there with our big, beautiful new clubhouse and look a little bit into the future of bookings we have for this upcoming year. Mm -hmm. um, as, we, as a lot of you attended, we, this was the Little Mo's this past year. Um, very successful. We had over 600 players in 60 countries represented. A huge event that lasted six days. Um, and a, a, lot of, a lot of kids um, of all um, nations there, all languages. It's probably one of, it is our biggest event, but it's, it's really a fun event to see everybody there. Um, the economic impact to the city is amazing because they are there so long. They're actually, when they come to this event, they usually make a vacation out of it because they travel so far. So even though our event lasted six days, they were probably here over a week or two, most of the families. So you see the room nights and the economic impact in this one event. 
The World Pickleball we did for the first time, um, that we were very proud of this event because it, we, it was our first event and we, like we said, we went bigger, went home. Um, so we, we really put this on and it was amazing what we did with, if you look at the courts closest to you, those, are our, those were our four tennis hard courts that we do our kids programs on, our wheelchair programs on. And the company that came in that we worked with, no cost to the city, flipped them, resurfaced them to make 12 additional pickleball courts. So that gave us a total of the 18 courts that we had for this event. We had all kinds of vendors. It was a fun event, a lot of music, a lot of action. Uh, pickleball people were very happy with this event and they, <laughs> they were begging us to keep the courts. <laughs> um, but we told them they were very useful in other avenues with, with our uh, community. So you'll see that we had 625 participants for this event and 700 matches. Just gives you a little bit. We had a, um, we had a retail area out there. We had the bar out there. They had the concessions. Everybody had a great time. Moving forward, we just hosted this event this past week, and it was the Les Grand Dames, which we have probably, this is our seventh year, eighth year of running this event. Um, it is ladies from all over, all ages. It's usually the age groups of the 30s to the 80s. And we had over 100 participants, 165 matches over five days. And once again, that is a big economic impact um, to the city. So looking ahead, um, these are events that you'll see that we've confirmed this, this year coming up. The uh, USTA National Clay, that's coming up the end of this month. And it's, it's similar to the, uh, the women's event that we just ran. A lot of the participants will return. Um, it's the ladies, the same thing with the age bracket. The Little Most East Regionals, we did that for the first time last year. They have booked with us again in April this year. It's one of their qualifying rounds to get to the big event that we host in December. They have it all over. They have it in California. They have it in Texas. So they added Florida as a stop, and we, we have got that event. USTA Boys Nationals, um, that's a big event because we do get that, and we get a lot of college recruits here. These are the kids that the colleges are looking at, to put into their colleges. So it's a great event. You'll see a lot of scouts in these events. Um, the boys, this is a national one for the boys. We do the same for the girls. Um, high, high-level players. Um, when we get into the September, this is another confirmed event, the, the men's uh, USTA National 70s through 90s. We did that last year for the first time, and it was amazing. It, it was a great group. We had a good time. Um, we have just confirmed the World Pickleball Classic, which is a new event. Um, that will be October 12th through the 15th. It is a series that we're doing, and it will tie right into the World Pickleball event. So what will happen is they'll come in and they'll resurface those courts for us back to pickleball again. And now we have four additional courts being that are under construction. So they'll be ready and so that will add four more courts to our pool. But they'll come in, resurface that, we'll run that event, and then we'll stay at re it will stay resurfaced until we hit the world, the world event. And then it will be turned back into the, the tennis. So that's, that's really exciting for us to have those, those two events back to back. ITF, International Tennis Federation, um, we've, we've worked with them before and had them in. This is a smaller version of the world one we had. Um, they have booked for October 30th through no November 5th. That's about 300 players coming from all over as well. Um, I already covered the World Pickleball, and then we're back full swing to Little Mo's again. We, they have booked it with us for this next year. So, any questions? Wendy, what does our team situation look like now? How many teams do we have that ladies are active? Teams? Ladies teams? Ladies teams. 16. Are there men's teams as well, or uh, it's just the ladies? No, group? we have nine, nine to ten men's teams, and they, they play throughout the season as well as the women. Do any of the tournaments conflict with their season, or everything is just... No, what, what happens, we, ha we, we get to schedule. So what we will do is we work with the, uh, the county that schedules all the events. We have what we call blackout dates, so every August I will submit all our blackout days for the, the weeks that they're here, and they, may, they play those matches away at the other facilities. So then we have them home on the days that there's nothing happening on ours. Thank you. Don't know what you do in your spare time, if you have any, but it seems like a pretty busy schedule to me, and thank you so very much 
for both of you for what you do over there in the management of that. I know it's out of love, but still, <laughs> it's a lot of time. Thank you for that. Well, thank you thank for you. your support. Yes. Happy you. birthday, Wendy. Oh, thank you. It was the other day. <laughs> and uh, next, Charlotte Brzezinski wants to uh, talk to you about a couple of very large upcoming events. Good evening, Council. Charlotte Brzezinski, Leisure Services Administrator. Um, just amazing what goes on at our golf and tennis center and really, truly outstanding city. So I get the pleasure tonight to share with you some upcoming events. Uh, February, we kind of call it the February Sprint. There's a lot of things that are happening. Um, as you guys know, there's that weekly little special event called the Green Market, about 3,000 people, music, dancing, food. And then uh, this Saturday night, we have um, our Eagles tribute band. Uh, hopefully the weather holds that we can do that, be right here in the plaza. But February Sprint includes two of the largest events that come to our community. So we're gonna kick off with Artie Gras on February 18th and 19th. This is the Palm Beach County, Nor or Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce. Third year that we've done this event, it's held at the Gardens North County District Park. Uh, in addition to the $2.8 million economic impact that that um, event brings to our community, we'll see 30,000 people that will come in and out those gates for two days. Um, interestingly enough, and uh, really wonderful to present, this year the Artie Gras has an app. You can scan the QR code there on the screen, or I've left flyers by the uh, front. This app is new and it's gonna help our patrons navigate their way around parking, the schedule of events and how to find artists. And it will talk about all the wonderful events that go on from the chef demonstrations to the children's area. Very family friendly event. You do not have to be an art aficionado to enjoy the day at uh, Gardens North County District Park. So join us for that. Next, the Honda Classic happens towards the end of this month. All of our favorite events are back, Military Appreciation Day, the fireworks, the concert, um, the awards ceremony after the final round on Sunday. That happens at the end of the month, but let's not lose uh, focus on what the Honda Cares Group does. Last year, over $6 million given to local charities that supported 100,000 children. So the Honda, Cares, Honda Classic Cares Program is truly why uh, this event happens to promote just the support in our community. It is a very fan-friendly event, and its economic impact is $65 million. Um, a lot of you recognize this image on the screen. It is the Bear Trap 16 and Par 3 17. The reason why I put that up there is the Honda Classic team puts a lot of focus on the public experience, not just that special ticket that you buy if you're gonna end up in the bear trap, but this year they've expanded all the public seating and the Patriots outposts in that area. So if you just have a daily admission ticket throughout the tournament, you can experience um, everything that goes on and get right up front to play. So we truly appreciate the Honda Classic team and their effort to make it uh, very welcoming to everybody who attends that tournament. Um, it's wonderful that we can say we're the host city of the two of the largest events that come to Palm Beach County. I do wanna mention, I get the opportunity to share this with you, but without the support of all of your departments that come to the table at every meeting that we hold to work with our partners to make these amazing events safe and very friendly to patrons, it wouldn't happen. So although I get to present it, um, all your departments take part in this and I thank their participation too. I'd be happy to answer any questions. No? Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. And Charlotte runs all those meetings and coordinates all of those efforts along with her day job. So thank you, Charlotte. Uh, next, we have an invitation, uh, Chief Shannon. evening again. Uh, we just want to remind everybody that this Saturday, February 4th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, the police and fire departments would uh, like to invite the whole community out to our annual public safety day. <laughs> um, it's held at uh, also at uh, um, Gardens North District Park, 
So uh, we're looking forward. We're going to have a lot of events. Um, the fire department and, and us, we're going to have demonstrations. So uh, we've gotten word out to all our schools. We're looking for a, a big turnout. So it's always a fun time. So hopefully we can get as many people out uh, on Saturday that we, as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, uh, yesterday's uh, Board of County Commissioner meeting, the uh, issue that you're all familiar with, eight laning of North Lake was uh, on their agenda uh, and uh, was being recommended by staff that it be transmitted uh, to the state for their review as a change to their comprehensive plan map. Uh, this is something that uh, a lot of a lot of staff members and people have been working on uh, for quite some time, just like we worked on the other, the eastern part of North Lake that they wanted to, to widen as well. Um, we had Sal Faso and the NCNC organization uh, uh, supporting our position. We had West Palm Beach supporting our position. Uh, and uh, we have had meetings with uh, their staff, their, I'm not staff, but their uh, uh, planning commission. And uh, now, uh, yes, yesterday, yeah, I forget which day it is. Uh, yesterday, uh, it went to uh, the county for their uh, vote on whether they wanted to transmit it to the state or not. But thank goodness, uh, our mayor was there, um, act actually was very awesome in the manner in which she politely tore them apart. Uh, and Natalie uh, wasn't going to speak, but apparently she was motivated to turn in a card and correct some erroneous information that was being shared, uh, along with South Faso and a whole bunch of uh, residents from our community uh, out there from uh, Bay Hill, uh, Osprey, Carlton, uh, and from Ibis, uh, West Palm Beach did an excellent job of, of talking this down. And uh, surprisingly, uh, we got a, a six to one vote in our favor. Uh, and there's a whole lot of people that worked on this. Uh, the mayor, Natalie, Max, Todd, Ross, uh, every person out there had a hand in this preparation of information, particularly the mapping information and Todd's engineering information that was actually read and understood and used by the residents from the city as well as the residents in West Palm Beach that used that information that we gave them uh, that, that helped win the day. So uh, Ross and Todd in particular were that detailed uh, information that they were able to put together uh, and the residents were able to use it. it. It was really great to see. And then again, with the performances of our mayor and our PNZ director, putting the point or the, the dot on the I, uh, it, was, uh, it was really good to see. And of course, the results were fantastic. So that's put to bed. Uh, that one's gone. So with that, uh, I want to thank everyone that was involved in this thing. And it, it was a good win. And it was for the right reason. And that's what we like. Thank you. I'm finished now. I, I want to comment on that. I, I wasn't there in person, but I did watch it. And it was a great team effort, for sure. Everyone did an excellent job. Natalie wrapped it up succinctly and uh, our mayor and and Maria, Maria Commissioner uh, Marino did a, a fabulous job also I might add um, so it was a it was great to watch I was cheering it on and in, in the you know in on the TV screen uh, but uh, it was a, a fun thing I appreciate everyone's help because I know it's something that people are ta we're talking about we're concerned about I mean no matter where I was walking the dog or at Alton or somewhere people would bring that up and ask me what's going on with it. I thought it was on and it's off, now it's on again. And I appreciate everyone's hard work and effort uh, knocked it out of the park and uh, it obviously, like uh, Ron said, the results were excellent. So thank you guys so much. And if I also might add, um, 
in, you know, Charlotte made a good point, uh, you know, with the Honda and fe everything going on in February and, and this, North Lake Boulevard, but the logistics of the Honda Classic and the logistics of Artie Gras, that's not a small feat. And you guys do such a fabulous job. And I know we, we're very proud of all of you, but I don't know if we say it enough, but when you see the Honda and you go there, it seems like it's effortless, but I know a lot of hard work went into that, and, and I want to thank you guys, I know, on behalf of the entire council. Um, we, we see you guys working, and we really, really, truly appreciate all that effort, and it pays off because look at what it does for our city and all of our residents and visitors, uh, business owners, and the impact that you mentioned. So uh, I just want to say thank you. Who was the... Um the nay vote, or who was the opposing vote that wanted to support the eight-laning? Commissioner Baxter. Baxter. Commissioner Baxter from out west of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. All set? Mayor, can I say something before sure. we move on? Of course, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to speak out of turn, but while we're thanking everybody, um, can I somehow get that dog park back up? There's one slide in there I want to, that kind of like goes and overlooks Lilac Park. I mean, you guys, we all get phone calls and stuff, and, you know, I usually don't say much about meeting with public or constituents or whatever, but this one, and a couple more were kind of relative, I thought you guys might want to know about. Not that one, it's when it shows the new, uh, that, that one's good. So, um, I almost started this quality of life initiative with Ron, and just because we get random phone calls and I usually meet with people and resolve things on a, on a council basis, whether it's just fish around a lake or something. But on this one, I had some people in the dog park call me and meet me over there. And I, I met them over there like around noon. It's going back, I think, chief, what, six, seven weeks ago, maybe eight, I don't know. Um, and when the high school kids get out of school, it's probably on a work release program, so a lot of them are leaving around noon. And what they'll do is if you can see beyond the benches there where the blue building is, it looks like there's a tarp to the left. They all congregate from the school because the school doesn't want them on their property. They want them to leave, go to work, go home, do what they do. So what they do is they all go over here, 100, 75, whatever. And when they called me over there, they're laying actually on top of these tarps that have got to be 25, 30 feet in the air. And it's not just a, a little. And they're, they're laying on the bench. Um, and they're almost scattered all over the place. So I saw this. I met with the, doesn't matter if they're constituents or what. I think I met with someone who comes down from Jupiter to, to walk her dog here too. And then um, I actually knocked on some neighbor's doors, because if you guys are aware of the lilac and plant area, it's no disrespect. It's a little bit lower rental area. Um, so I kind of thought it was a quality of light issue. And I asked, is this really going on all the time? And it was. So I got with, I got with the manager. And this is a thank you kind of thing. I got with the manager, I got with the chief, got with the assistant manager, and I go, well, what can we do about this? Our dog part's now beautiful. We have a kid problem. So the, the chief implemented some extra um, enforcement, and we got with the school. It still seems like the school doesn't care. They want the kids gone. Um, but I have been visiting that area and talking to some other people, and I actually asked all of them to meet me out there the other day and we all walked it together and we talked with people in the dog park and they're saying it's much better. So I know I didn't want this to get washed out because sometimes staff leaves. Um, it might be a little bit out of order, but I wanted to say thank you for taking the extra effort because the dog park is absolutely stunning. And they have these little dog fountains that are like this high off the ground. Now. <laughs> I wish you would have showed that picture because it's like you can wash your dog. Anyway, whatever, I'm just talking. So thanks for cleaning this little quality of life issue up that seems to be very important to the people on plant and lilac, chief of police. And, you know, I don't know if you guys have gotten some other calls on the dumpsters and the racing and North Lake, but um, that's why I talked to Ron. I go, I might start a little quality of life initiative and maybe um, see if we can do some more things on this, these simple calls that I get. So thanks for listening to me.
I'll, I'll get right. I'm sorry. If we could just pause for one second. I think Marcy has a question. Go ahead. Do you want to ask? Yes. Is resolution 14, 2023, is that on, con on the consent agenda or at the end? It's, it's at the end, ma'am. Okay. It's under items for council. I just wanted to make discussion. sure. Thank you. All right. So next is the consent agenda. Is anyone pulling anything off at all tonight? All right. So if nothing's being pulled, can I get a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda, please? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Any opposed? I mean, all in favor? Excuse me. Aye. 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 And none opposed. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to be having public hearings. I'm going to read the quasi-judicial statement. Tonight, we are holding quasi-judicial hearings on the following case, Resolution 7, 2023, PGA Waterfront Site Plan Modifications. This means that the City Council is required by law to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official City file in this application, and any documents presented during this hearing. The Council is required by law to allow cross-examination of any witness who testifies tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, and other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the order of the witness's appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, please fill out a card over to my right over here and give it to our city clerk over to my left right here. And the city clerk will now swear in all persons who intend to offer testimony this evening on any or on this case. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. If the clerk could please read the title. Resolution 7, 2023, a resolution in the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending the site plan for PGA Waterfront located on the southwest corner of the intersection of PGA Boulevard and Ellison Wilson Road to add eight dwelling units, increase the building height to 86.48 feet, realign the north and south buildings and drive aisles, and permit other site modifications, providing conditions of approval, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to open the hearing. Go ahead, Marcy. And uh, Madam Mayor, I just want to let you know I'm recusing myself from Resolution 7, 2023. Uh, my husband uh, and his uh, engineering company is working on this project. Thank you, ma'am. All right, we're going to uh, go ahead and declare ex parte. I'll start down at the end. Carl? Negative. Mark? Nope. Rochelle? Nope. And I have none either, so we're going to ask the petitioner to please come to the podium. Hey, George. So we have George Gentile at the podium. Good evening. Um, for the record, um, let me get my program started here. There we go. For the record, uh, George Gentile, president of 2GHO Inc., landscape architects, planners, and environmental consultants. And we're very pleased to be here tonight. Um, and you have been sworn in. Uh, yes, I have been sworn in. Thank you. Um, I made sure I did that. <laughs> Um, but we're very, very pleased here to, uh, to bring you this phenomenal project. Um, I know that uh, we attempted annexation many years ago, and this will be my fourth time, and I know it's going to get built because you have a great, great builder that's going to be doing this project. So, um, And I can tell you because we're already pretty far along with working drawings. So anyway, so uh, just really quick, DMBH Residential Investments LLC and PGA Landings Marina LLC, which is the marina portion, there is 29 slips here, and you'll see that in a minute, but 23 uh, are part of the leasing program uh, for the PGA Landings LLC. And of course, Catafumo Companies, uh, Dan Catafumo is here, and uh, I'm going to ask Dan to come up just before the end, at the end of my presentation. He wants to make a few words, if that's okay. Uh, Mayor. Thank you. Um, uh, the architects are Spino Work Partners. Uh, they've been uh, working with us and done a phenomenal job. The landscape architect planner is our firm, 2GHO Inc. And um, as you just heard, the civil engineering firm doing uh, the civil work is WGI Inc. Um, and traffic engineering is being done by Kenley Horn. A uh, great team and a great effort to put this together. Um, this is the site plan um, of the project. Um, uh, I'm going to go over this fairly quickly. I think a lot of you know, know the project so that uh, your staff can get up here in a minute and go over it. So um, 
the request is for uh, increasing the number of units to uh, 106 from 98. Uh, however, this, uh, we are reviewing this under the county uh, ULDC and the county comp plan because we're not changing that at this time. And on January 12th, you all have annexed this property in. Um, but we have to do this to, to keep ourselves on schedule, and we really appreciate working with your staff on this. Um, it's 10.97 acres, um, and uh, uh, the existing zoning is in the county is PUD, uh, and it's uh, RM, uh, residential medium density. Uh, but the land use, which is critical here, is the HR12, which is uh, high residential, 12 units per acre, and commercial high with 12 units per acre. So even though there's a split land use, we can you do residential across the entire thing. Um, and there's the, the listing of the uses um, uh, that were approved at the county level. Um, and then uh, we are asking for the increase in the uh, units. Now, this is the approved development plan that was in the county. And if you watch really close, uh, this is the new plan. You don't see much difference. There's a little bit of difference in the entry uh, way. We are asking the, the city council to allow us to modify the entry drive and, and uh, drop off area to the south building. Um, the two uh, buildings uh, on the north and south side uh, in a portion of them have been, we're asking to raise to a seventh floor. Um, and then the building that is a, along Elson Wilson Road, we're asking for that same seventh floor on that building, which brings us to the 106 units in the project. Um, so uh, I went through most of this, uh, uh, and I won't uh, go through it again, but uh, this is 25 units less than the 131 that are allowed, and the uh, density is actually 2.34 DUs acres less uh, than allowed, and as I said, we have 29 slips. Um, we do have an increase in parking, and in the county, there is no restriction on how much parking you put, as long as you meet the code. Um, and so we have uh, quite a bit of extra parking on this, but what you'll see in this is that most of the parking is not visible to the public. It's underground. The site goes from elevation 31 at Donald Ross Road to 5.5 at the bulkhead. And so we've tucked all the parking in, and you'll see, you won't see much of the parking, but we do have some parking. And I'm going to take you very quickly around the property. Uh, this is the entry area that comes off of Elson Wilson to the gate. Uh, it comes right off. We have a turn lane that's going in that we've been working with the county on and now working with the city as well and some of our documentation. The other driveway that you see uh, in this location at the south end is actually for emergency services only. It'll have a Knox box gate lock on it, and we have been working with your uh, fire rescue team as well as we did with the county to allow that to happen. Um, the project uh, driveway goes along the south and goes down around the building, and you can see the entryways. This is a drop off, an entryway under the building to the garage area, and that drive goes all the way around. If any of you were, I know most of you were here, or maybe you all weren't here, but we had, when we did this project in the county um, two versions ago, uh, we had an issue with fire rescue going around the site. We rectified that in this plan was when Mr. Catafumo took over, we made sure that there was a driveway going around. You have a great dog park. We were fortunate, our office, to design the dog park in Jupiter that you love and go to. Uh, but uh, the residents will have a, a waterfront dog park here, I'm afraid to say, on the intercoastal waterway, and that's down in this far <laughs> corner. So that's the residents area for that, and it's, a, it's their own com com neighborhood park that was part of our project. You can see the private marina slips on this side uh, of the project on the left, and the marina side uh, that goes towards uh, the um, right side of the graphic. And then you start to see the amenity deck uh, from this area. This is our amenity deck. It's two levels. The pool is down at the waterfront level and the, the driveway level. And then as you come up to the, to the uh, above the pool area, that is the, 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 what we call the court area, uh, the upper terrace lawn area. And that is also an amenity area for the residents. Um, and we have uh, uh, cabanas and, and other things in the program for the residents there, as well as access to the marina. Uh, and those slips. And this gives you a full picture of the whole full site development plan um, and the 23 slips that are 
in the marina area. That is a that was zoned a commercial marina. Uh, it's um, it's a recreation parcel, but is a, is allowed in the county to have a commercial marina. However, we have no clean fish cleaning. We have no commercial activities. No fueling. Uh, the FDEP does not allow us to do that. So it's strictly for leasing those slips uh, to the um, to the residents. It is open if the resident doesn't take it, but it is a. Uh, we anticipate that out of 106 units, all 23 slips will be gone and stay in the. Uh, will be with the residents here. So I'm going to just very briefly show you some of the renderings. This is a view from the uh, uh, north, uh, actually coming under the bridge. Um, uh, of the uh, of the project and the marina we're actually moving and the marina is being constructed now we're moving the bulkhead wall from its original in about 42 feet to allow larger yachts in this area which is also and it also provides more uh, width to the intercoastal here between the waterway cafe uh, waterway cafe and this property which is a, is a very used area on the waterway I come down every couple of weeks from Jupiter and drive my boat through here as well Here's where you can get a view. This is from the Intercoastal Waterway. You can see the amenity area, the, the two amenity areas, the upper terrace area, uh, and you can see the, the, how you, you can actually enter in and get into your units from this area of the pool deck uh, without having to go upstairs. You can go upstairs. You can go up elevators. There's uh, all uh, methods of getting through there. This is a shot looking to the northeast, and again, you get a, a view of the architecture uh, and the terracing of the amenity areas uh, on the project. It really came out very nice. The, the elevation change just it was very difficult to work with, but it really made for a great project. Uh, this is the intercoastal view of east with the marina slips there. Um, and this is a bridge view that you can see from uh, to the southeast coming over the bridge. Um, you're very much not going to see the side that is closest to the PGA bridge that is also a very steep slope and heavily landscaped and we're putting in more landscape and this is our landscape plan for the Elson Wilson corner uh, and PGA uh, this is the turn lane that was uh, uh, built uh, as part of the original approval project project for PGA uh, waterfront uh, which is I just the the name is of course branded uh, the Ritz Carlton residences of Palm Beach Gardens uh, or Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. So, um, uh, but we are looking at it as it was in the county right now. So, uh, some of the interior views. I'll go through these. I'm almost done. So, Mayor, so that you'll know that uh, these are some of the views, uh, actual views from the apartments. Uh, this is looking to the west. Um, uh, this is looking uh, to the south, uh, towards the in along the intercoastal waterway from the south building. The balconies are phenomenal. Uh, I could probably live out here with a tent. And I wouldn't have a problem in one of the balconies. Uh, nobody would bother me. So no. But these are uh, they're they're very gorgeous. And this is the interior designs, and this is the quality uh, that you're getting here. And this is the overall project in a in a um, a view uh, elevated view. Um, and we are very pleased to present this to you all. And I'll stop. I'm, I I do want to thank thank all of your staff. I would like to thank the the city manager. Um, Natalie and her staff and uh, everyone who's helped us this was very complicated keeping it in the county format and bringing it into the city to make sure that we meld everything together so kudos and thank you so much to your staff and I'm gonna let mr. Catapudo make a couple comments thank you good evening Dan Catalfimo mayor vice mayor council member all right we're gonna ask you if you've been sworn in yes I have been or Martin will ask if I don't <laughs> <laughs> As you know, I've been doing this 35 years here in Palm Beach Gardens. This is my home. This is my life. Um, it has been the most incredible journey dealing with the Ritz-Carlton. This will be our third project with them. It is the number one brand in the world. As you know, we've developed most of PGA Boulevard, and this is our final, I wouldn't say final project, but it is definitely the kudo product that we want to be able to bring you. One thing we wanted to be able to say is, if it wasn't for the leadership of Ron Ferris, Max, Natalie, Martin, Peter, and, and everybody in your whole departments have jumped in and literally said, roll up our sleeves, let's get this done. It has been absolutely incredible, and we're actually honored to be back in Palm Beach Gardens. Thank you. Well, well said.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, our amazing staff, absolutely. Um, Martin, do we have a staff presentation tonight? Uh, Madam Mayor, um, for the record, Martin Fitz, and uh, have been sworn. We don't have a, a specific presentation that's needed. Um, this, the applicant did a very good job. There are a few things I would like to point out. Um, the applicant has agreed to provide 12 EV chargers um, at the time of construction. Uh, all told, they, they are wiring um, the majority of their parking spaces so that about um, up to about 250 <coughs> spaces would be available um, to the property owners to have uh, installed for their units if they desired to. The wiring will be going in at construction. And that wiring was level two or three. It was up to the resident, right? Okay, thanks, sorry to interrupt. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Uh, and also, um, this was heard at the planning zoning on the 17th, and it was recommended approval six to one, and staff recommends approval of resolution seven as presented. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, do you guys want to chat about this, Mark? I have some questions. Yeah, I have, I have a some questions. simple question. Um, how do you park in the one building that's furthest east? I mean, you can- also behind it. But I didn't see an I'm sorry, I didn't see an entrance. Not that it matters, but I'm just kind of curious. I see the entrance yeah, there, to the there, south and the north. Is, yes, there there is an entrance uh, to that area around this this uh, the east side. So there is uh, another let entrance. Back, let me go back to the plan real quick. Um, I'm sorry. Let me go back to the uh, site plan. Might help. Yeah. Where's the entrance to the building? Right. Seventy nine. So there's there is access right here to uh, this building. And there is a pedestrian, and we have a lot of pedestrian circulation um, uh, through the entire site. But that is the uh, that's the access point. That's oh, right. Hidden behind all the trees underneath yes. letter F. Yes. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And then, and then the the of course the entire plate is a, a two level parking garage, so you'll flow through the entire thing to all the buildings. So it's it's uh, you have access. So you could come in another area and get to the other parking parking spaces. Uh, Mark, anything else? A question? Michelle, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, you just, so what you were just saying is the parking lots are all connected underground from all three. Okay. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? Uh, yeah, that one's good enough. Okay. The seventh floor is only Right what? here, just this two, little, this piece two, right here? Yeah. And the two the, pieces that so that's only partial on partial partial on those building and then this entire area across was it two units on each of the side buildings there's um yes yes two units on each side and then um six on the center the gorgeous Sorry. <laughs> four four right, four yes, in the center four units on the on the east on the uh, eastern building yes the beautiful view that you were showing down the intracoastal if you look at that corner building is that one unit that wraps around onto ellison wilson yeah. so they get actually yeah. views of both not one apartment getting a view of ellison wilson and right. yeah okay. carl okay question before we keep going does this um does this show art anywhere? Are we doing art in public places? Or are we required to on this? Uh, we did not have that requirement in the county uh, for the art in public places. Yeah, but yes, there's no requirement in the county, nor would there be a requirement in the city. The art program that we have is for non-residential. Yeah, I kind of figured. Anyway, um, I know uh, Dan and Joey have, have called me a couple times about going to your, is it a planning and design center? So I like to feel I have a, a relationship with Dan and Joey and obviously you, but I'm talking about Dan specifically as the developer on this and other projects. And we meet and we talk on of often on stuff, but um, I'm going to encourage council members elect. I'm going next week. We'll bring everybody to the design center because I heard that um, outside of just talking to you that it's really um, something that's special to see. So I'm going to go next week, probably later in the afternoon. 16th, right? uh, when is it? February 16th. Yeah. yeah, that's two weeks. I'm going next week. 
<laughs> so I'm going when I want, and I think you guys should too. But I'll see you guys next week, so I just encourage everybody to get to know Dan a little bit better because he's so ingrained in our community, and he's not as bad as he looks. He looks like a tough guy, but he's not that tough. So I'll see you guys next week. Rochelle, you I don't know. Just, I'm just going next week. You had another yeah, question? I had, um, now I've forgotten what the question was. All right, come back around. I I'll forgot come, what the right, question was. Um, oh, I know what the question was. Martin, what was the one dissenting, what was the reason for the one dissent at planning and zoning? Uh, the dissension was from Commissioner Chris Oftedell, and his dissension involved primarily the <laughs> density intensity proposed for the project. But the audio minutes, the full audio minutes are available on our website. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, I have one or two quick questions. Um, not that I imagine these folks are going to be walking across the street to get their groceries often, because I'm sure that will be, everything will be brought in. Can I see a little bit, or can you explain a little bit, it could be staff or, or Mr. Gentile, whoever feels like doing it, um, the walkability within the area is wonderful. So if someone wants to cross the street to get to all the wonderful amenities, how easy is that to do? Uh, yeah, I can address that. That'd I be mean, great. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that we uh, actually separated the buildings a little bit more was to actually increase the width of the walkability to get through the project, through the buildings, uh, let more airflow, of course, and, but we also had utility items mm -hmm. that we had to deal with. But um, if I could go back very quickly to the, uh, to the site plan, because I think that uh, I'm going to go right here, if I could. But, as you can see, uh, we have uh, walkways that, that actually uh, come in through the entryway. They go uh, across the emergency access and they wind all the way through the project, all the way down to the park. Uh, you, walk, you can go along the, the marina front. We have walkways connecting from the top portion of the entry drive to every building. You can see them on both sides. There's a whole series of walks. And then they also come out and you get onto the PGA uh, I mean, the Elson Wilson sidewalk, you can get onto PGA uh, and cross at PGA. You can go across the bridge over to the Waterway Cafe. Uh, I could tell you that it, we were very, very um, um, involved in making sure there was tremendous walkability in this project. Um, we even increased it when, uh, when Mr. Catafumo took over because of his knowledge and our knowledge of the mobility uh, programs that you have here and we tried to address those as much as we could you can really see it so okay great thank you that was a good answer and then um, I do have one more question it's a trivia question do you remember what was there in the 70s on that corner yes I well the 70s uh, the the Panama Hatties before no, that like 1973 it was um, it was a biker house Yes, right, that's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, this is also the famous rum bar site. I mean, that, right. that, that yeah, wasn't no. ever permitted, uh, but all of us probably went there at I, some yeah. point. No, I just remember some, being some a, a kid yes. and going that's to school right. um, on that right-hand turn, and there was a little house on that corner, but most of the people were dumb sleep outside. Yeah, so. You're right, yeah, you're right. Different. All right, so uh, we're going actually, to. Actually, that house was, there, the house was Chris Doyle's, and it was up in the upper end here. Really? Yeah, Gosh. and uh, Chris Doyle owned the Panama Hatties project and the rum bar, and then sold it to um, the uh, allied capital. Thank you for that history. We appreciate it. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll um, make a motion. Uh, second. Oops, sorry. Any further discussion? All right. Well, thank you guys so much for this project. Thank you, staff, for, um, for jumping in so much. Sounds great. Loving the walkability. Let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we're moving on to items for council action, discussion, and interest. And I'm going to wait for Marcy. Well, Marcy's walking up. Oh, Natalie's busy. Um, they were... They were Natalie, while you're there, I'm going to embarrass you. So um, while we're, Marcy's getting settled so that we can finish um, our um, items for discussion, but I want to congratulate you. Tomorrow you uh, will be going to the Safe Street Summit because you have been nominated for an award. 
one, one of many, I hope, and you were nominated, I wanna make sure I say the right thing, you were nominated for the Community Award for the whole county, for Palm Beach County, and we want to congratulate you. We think you're a winner, and also to thank staff for being such a big part of putting together the application. So, yeah. early congratulations. Thank you. All right, so. Let's dig in. So we have a council meeting on April 6th that has conflicts for a holiday. And we have a lot going on at that meeting. It will be bittersweet. We will have our last meeting with Mark and Rochelle and our first meeting with Dana and Bert coming on board. So we wanna make sure everybody is respected and the time is chosen. We received an email from the city manager um, with some suggestions. So let's start with that and work our way through. I see Marcy, you pushed your button, go for it. Ma ma oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Madam Mayor, may I, no, I forget these <laughs> things, I for, I'm sorry, I forget these things are so loud now. All right. um, we just need to read the, the Oh, I apologize, I'm just digging sorry. in. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, I appreciate it. I'm sorry, Patty, could you please read it? Yes, ma'am. Well, Resolution 14, 2023, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, providing for the it's April 6, 2023, regular meeting of the City Council to convene at a time to be determined, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you. <coughs> All right, Marcy, you had your light on. You had your light on. So I guess we'll just start with a discussion. Well, I think we should start with the email we were given that had some... Well, it's, I mean, I, I don't mind using that as the basis. Okay. Um, thank you for sending the email. Um, as you know, uh, what we're talking about is the April um, 6th council meeting, which is actually the second day of Passover. And as some of you may know, Passover, the first and the second day of Passover, or evening of Passover, there's a Seder involved. And the Seder, as some of you may know, is very long <laughs> and uh, involves a lot of family and it's time consuming. And so obviously this is one of the, one of the important Jewish holidays. Um, this one in Yom Kippur, we're very lucky because not very many Jewish holidays fall on our council meetings. It just so happens that this one does. And just to not that it means anything right now, but in 2025, Yom Kippur, giving you very a lot of notice, uh, in 2025, Yom Kippur will be on a Thursday night. So uh, this will be coming up again in, in 2025. But I did look at the calendar. Um, there's Sundown is, really doesn't play a part um, in the second night of Passover and the Seder. However, um, obviously, we want to do our business. We want to make sure that we swear everyone in. It is a bittersweet holiday. Um, personally, my family gets involved. I do a lot of the cooking with my parents. Um, so it's something that I will not be able to attend, whether it's five, six, seven, eight. However, a suggestion might be to do it that morning um, or to do it um, that afternoon or the Tuesday prior to the Thursday, the 6th. Um, those are suggestions. Tuesday night is before the holiday. Um, if you wanna do it then, that's fine, or doing it on the actual uh, 6th, but in the morning. The 6th in the morning with a whole house full of family and cooking all day is, and it's, it just sends a bad message to the community that we're holding the meeting on this day. Uh, the Jewish population's one eighth of the county right now. And I just don't think it's in the best interest. And it would be very difficult. Would you not, rather do it on the Tuesday? Fair. Tuesday's fine, Monday's fine. Um, looking I'm, at what we got from the city manager, I also see that, I mean, resolution 90 that said it's every day except for July and September that we do it, should be amended at some point to include religious holidays and federal holidays. We switch it for 
January 1st, if that falls yeah. on a holiday, you know. I it's... agree with you, Rochelle, and it does, in pursuant to chapter, uh, pursuant to section 4.3. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to interrupt for one second. Let's, I want to, let's get the calendar sorted first, and then we'll bring it back to talk about what we want to do next, because you both mentioned, just, I want to back up before we get, so uh, you mentioned the 4th, which is Tuesday, or the 5th, which is Wednesday, and um, some of us will be in... Uh, Wednesday. No, 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 not Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday is Passover. Night. All right. The 3rd or 4th, Monday or Tuesday. Negative. So, we have council members that will be absent that day, too. I'm, I'm, my plane lands Tuesday night, 1030. Okay. And so... Um, you mean you're out of town until Tuesday at 1030? Yeah, I'm out from the 24th till that Tuesday. And I checked it with Mark while we were sitting here to see if mm -hmm. we can come in. But I, I land Tuesday night at yeah. 1030. And, and, and just to um, clarify, uh, Rochelle, I agree with what you're saying. Um, but... What I was starting to say is uh, section 4.3 of the city charter, it does say the next regular scheduled meeting of the city council following the municipal election or as may be established by a majority vote of the council. That's, that, so that is an option as what well. What about the morning, Friday? Since morning was postured, what about Friday morning? The morning Friday after, the 7th of the April. The 7th of April, that that morning or sometime during the day on Friday. I mean, it's Good Friday. All right, so real quick, before anyone, meant, like, good, let me just that's wait. That's Good Friday, Hang on. that's While not good either. When we're saying, let's, let's go all the way down one time and let's hear it from everybody. We've got Mark and Carl. How do we feel about the 7th of April in the morning? It's Good Friday. So I, I take that back. I wouldn't do that on Good Friday either. And I hate to say this, but the 7th of April, I'm babysitting my... Um, my new grandbaby and uh, three-year-old grandbaby on that Friday. And the city's closed. Okay. okay. All right. Well, Thank you yeah, for that. Well, that's Good Friday. All right. And um... if I may reiterate the memo, we've done the research, and you know, prior to April six, uh, we're still missing any one council member. The next week, we're missing any one council member. So it, 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 you can be required to go to the week of the 17th. Now, uh, that, and that's why we we're recommending uh, any time uh, on that Thursday, April the 6th. April 6th, yeah. April 6th. Uh, so. Um, Do you know if it's going to be a big agenda? At all, I know it's hard well, to know. It's it's months away. From what I know now, uh, you have board and committee re, uh, appointments, but I don't know how many that would be. It's relatively light right now. Very agenda. light. So, uh, for for the uh, new council members to take their seats, the council members that are here on the dais, uh, once the uh, election results are read. Uh, then the new leave people right take their seats, and I don't mean to be insensitive, but you're done. <laughs> you can go home if you want to, but at the same time, it's a light agenda. We could do it at noon, and if you want, we'll provide you some lunch if you want. No, but noon's not good. I got a whole family to at the house. Okay. What day? Well, hold on. But, okay, Rochelle, is there an either one Wednesday or Thursday that would accommodate you better for like an hour or so? So we want to be sensitive to everybody here, but I think well, the Wednesday's the Wednesday is is fine. Passover doesn't begin till sundown on Wednesday. I have nobody at my house on Wednesday. Marcy, you good with I Wednesday? I go to my sister, so and we don't start oh, till eight. So let's Wednesday start. morning. So okay. Wednesday wow. morning works. So Wednesday morning. What time on Wednesday morning? What about Mark? Are you good with Wednesday? Well, I can. I just look. I, I need to. I need to schedule my office pace. I mean, I start work at ten o'clock on Wednesday, so I could come in at nine and be done by ten. And morning leave. would be better. Okay. Otherwise, so I mean, I, I don't want to take another time. I mean, I'm happy to do whatever people want to want to do. But look, we are elected officials in the city of Palm Beach Gardens. We owe it to the next council, and to the staff to get get work done and get started as soon as possible. Um, waiting until the 17th and beyond is no. just way too Not long out. Wednesday morning, what time? I, I would rather do it first thing in the morning versus the afternoon because I also am doing a Seder on Wednesday. So Wednesday morning at 9 would work for me. 
I could do nine at one Wednesday. What about you, Mark? No. That's fine. Nine o'clock Wednesday morning, uh, April fifth. Chelsea. Nine on Wednesday. I'll, I'm going to be there, whatever date it is. I'm with you. I'm. <laughs> I'm here to work. I'm. I'm. I'm going to be there. Um, I'm sorry to talk to you in the middle of this. I'm here yes. Anyway. Staff's good. We're good for Wednesday morning at nine. All right. Up. Caveat is that we, of course, will have to make sure that Bert Primoroso is available so that he can be sworn in. He's got to make himself available. Well, I mean, that's not. Are you We're voting on it. Okay? <laughs> We're voting on it. Okay? What choice do Dana we have? Dana said she's available. Okay. Okay. So right now we have a consideration for Wednesday, April 5th at 9 a.m. here in City Hall and Chambers. Looks Can I make good. a motion to? Uh, I don't. Do we need? A, do we? How do we vote on it, Max? Is there anything? Yes. Um, you can just make a motion to adopt the resolution with um, change. Thank you, Mark. Yes, okay. we do. With changing the meeting to uh, April fifth at nine p.m. Or make the motion to move the, the April sixth meeting to Wednesday, April fifth at nine a.m. I'll second. And do we need to make a motion to approve resolution fourteen, stating that's that? That's part of that. That's. Okay. All right. So it looks like. Resolution 14 has passed through. The April 6th meeting is now going to be on April 5th at 9 a.m. Boom. So we can call the question. All right, so we'll call it to question then, please. We're done Aye. after that? Aye. 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 All right, so uh, motion passes. Good. Finders. Great. Now that we did that, Max. If you, uh, do you have a city attorney appointment tonight? Um, Max. Do you have a city attorney's report this no, evening? All right. If there's no other business, this meeting is adjourned. Uh, oh, I'm sorry.